good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm glad to see each and every one of you here. Uh, we're missing several people today due to illness, so make sure you uh, you pray for those that are not here. Um, uh, appreciate you praying for my mom. She's got a few little things going on and was not feeling well to be here. My daughter is not feeling well, but she is feeling better this 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 afternoon than she was this morning. So that's a good thing. And, I heard Mrs. Gentry wasn't feeling well, so uh, Brother Ted's not here, uh, so he's probably home helping take care of, uh, of her, uh, some other people that are out due to, to various things, so just uh, pray for one another. We, we can definitely use that. Uh, also, right after, right after the service, we've got a pumpkin pie that we're going to be uh, sharing next door. So, oh, it's got, yeah, we got Cool Whip, too. It's, it's legit. It's, it's the real deal. You can, don't even offer me pumpkin pie if you don't have Cool Whip, because I will not eat it. Just something about Cool Whip that just completes it, you know, and I think it's what the Lord would have us to do, is to, have to make sure that pie is complete, amen? So, uh, we'll, we'll be sharing that uh, right after the service, so we're excited about that. Also, um, I, I don't usually mention this on uh, Sunday evenings, but uh, if you ever come and you like you were you didn't have a chance to give in the mornings or whatever, uh, the offering plates are up in the back. Drop it, uh, drop it off in the back there for us, and uh, we'll make sure it gets deposited. Uh, so those are right there, back there at the back door. Uh, continue to uh, continue to pray for all the things. That we've got going on, things coming up. So uh, fall is quick; it's in gear and it's in full speed. Uh, so we're we're almost halfway through October already. Uh, and I didn't mention it this morning, but do pray for us next week. Uh, next week we're going to Shriners for Katie's uh, annual appointment. So uh, remember that, if you would please, in your prayers. Uh, oh, my phone's doing the live, so I don't have the date right in front of me, but I believe it's uh, Thursday next week. So more more than likely, we will probably not be here that Wednesday uh, for, for Wednesday. So I'll probably have Pastor Ron take, uh, take that uh, uh, service for us. But uh, do uh, keep that in prayer. Let's take our Bibles, if you would, please. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 5 and read down through verse 11. And also uh, pray for the McNamara's. I noticed that they weren't here today, uh, this evening either. So uh, it's on my heart. The people are just on my heart. And, uh, you know, we, we just need to pray for them. All right, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For unto the angels hath he... Uh, not put in subjection the world to come wherever we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not uh, put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became, for it became him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So I'd like to preach tonight on what is man that thou art mindful of him. Uh, this is pretty, um, this is pretty awesome because this was, 
from what we read, this was an actual angel asking the question. Here we have an angel asking God, what is man that you're even mindful of him? I, I, I just think, you know, I think that that's a, a, a really good thing to, to, to look at. And, you know, and the Bible does tell us very plainly that the angels are curious about certain things. They're, they're curious to look into certain things, like salvation, for instance, because they have no idea what this is all about. They're curious about it. They want to know about it. But when you stop and think about it, man, what is man? That thou art mindful of him. Who are we that God would be not only be mindful of us, but to put everything under subjection and, and let us be over the works of his hands? Right? Think about that. God made everything, and then what did he do? He placed man over it to have dominion over it and, and to, to take care of it, to keep it, and, and to dress it, and to, to name it, and to be over it. And that, that it would be un, under our subjection. I, I think that's just amazing to think about. So let's ask a blessing over the message. Father, now we, uh, we want you to take over this time, Lord, as we look into your word together. Help us to see what is man that thou art mindful of him. Uh, Lord, we're, we're just, we just love you so much and uh, we're, uh, we're just in a place where it's it's almost hard to believe that you would put your the works of your hands in our care and our keeping for us to be involved in. But Lord, help us to see those things and help us to see the reasonings tonight uh, as we look in your word. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have for us. Lord, be with those that cannot be here due to illness or uh, providentially being hindered, Lord. Bless them, help them where they are, uh, send healing where it needs to go. And Lord, we just ask now, Father, that you would just bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you know, I, I mean, just, just think about that. I don't know if any of you have ever just thought, I'm sure at some point in your life you've had to just ask and like wonder, like, why is God even thinking about, why are we a thing? Like, why is this? Why, why does God think about me? You know, because I, most of us are probably in, in a place where we maybe forget that God even thinks about us because we're, we're just that humble that I'm not worthy to be thought of, you know. But, you know, God, God, God thinks about us. Now think of this immense universe that we live in. Think of the size of our solar system that we live in. Think of the size of the earth of what we live and in, in which we live and we are just a dot until you realize how small we are when you're up in a plane you look like an ant I and mean, i'm not talking about your your, your uncle's wife i'm, I'm saying well, you look like an ant you're small you're, you just look like these little dots that are just going everywhere you know pools look like puddles and you know you, you know how it goes I've always been fascinated when I'm taking airplane rides and you can see like all the little divisions of the land and how it's all squared up and all that. You see all the houses that look like Barbie houses and uh, you, you, you see all the little things, the little tiny matchbox cars, right? You, you see all these things and you think, wow, the higher you get, the smaller everything else gets. So. And now think about where God sits. You have the heaven, the heavens, which is the sky. Then you have the second heaven, which is your outer space, that, that outer thing. And then you have the third heaven, which is beyond that. That's where he is. That's where he abides. Now how, I mean, goodness. Think about how small we, you, I mean, think about the microscope you would need at this point to go past all the solar systems and all the universes uh, that are out there and, and, and find us here in Lincoln Park, Michigan. Think, think about that tonight. That's crazy to think about. You think there ain't no way. There ain't no way that God sees me way down here in Lincoln Park, Michigan when he's way up there. But he does. 
thinks about us. And, and it's amazing. Why would the God of this universe be willing to die for the sins of a finite man such as I? You know, that he came that far for something that couldn't really even be detected. He came that far because we mattered that much. Hey, you know, I've, I, I've, I've done things for people. I've driven for states and states across the country for people. Yeah, when my uncle died, I drove, uh, I drove my, my aunt home. I, I was up for 24 hours that day. I drove by my great aunt Ruth. Uh, we were in the car. We got there. I got her in my truck. We dr drove on down to West Virginia. And we'd been up, I don't know, been up all night and been up through the day. And we, we just were up. And so she needed a ride home, and I, I drove her down there. I'm like, I, obviously, we, she'd been up there for like months. She'd been up here to come stay, and you know, in, in a way, my great aunt Ruth was almost like the death angel. If she come to stay, you were in bad trouble because she, she that was part of her ministry to people is that she would come and she would stay with them, she would care for them, you know, and I could still see her. Uh, you know, and it, it, I, I never once, I'm going to be honest with you, God is my witness. I've never seen her in a pair of pajamas. Ever. I've never seen it. I could see her, she would be in like her church clothes and her skirt, and she would, she would lay down on the couch, just like that, and she, she just, she'd just be there, ready to just get up, pop up, and do. My great aunt was an amazing woman. And she would go a long way for people that she loved and cared about. Her family meant a lot to her. And I still miss her. I can't hardly, it's still, it, it's still, it's still hard for me to believe that she's in heaven right now. She would go for a long way and, 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 and just to be there for people because she was mindful of that. She was mindful of the need of that. She was tuned in to what people needed, and she knew that, that she could be there and let somebody get some sleep, and she would be up there helping while she, and it was a huge blessing. It was an enormous blessing when, when she came, but it, but it oftentimes, sorry to say it, oftentimes it meant you were dying. So when she came in, it was almost like the death angel was there. Because it was, it would not be that long till you were gone. Now that's not just saying just a regular visit, because you know that, that that was fine. But if she was coming to camp out, yeah, that's not. It wasn't good for you. The outlook for you was not good. But that was part of her ministry uh, to people. And you know what? God allowed her to live so much longer. Uh, it, it's it's just it's just phenomenal when I stop and I think about. You know, I mean, that was the last of, uh, of my, my grandmother's sisters. She outlived them all. And she was in her 90s. I think 94, 95, I think somewhere in that ballpark. I think she was around 94-ish. God allowed her, and they had a long life. I mean, her and my grandpa Bill are one of the reasons that Pastor Ron is in the ministry right now. It had a huge influence over countless other people. And they gave their lives to God and it meant something. But you know, uh, over all this time, you think about why does God think about us? And, and over several millenniums prior to the coming of Christ, Israel's thinking had changed from a very personal God to an impersonal one. The New Testament portrays a personal God and Savior in the person of Jesus Christ. Now remember in the Old Testament, God was standoffish. God would be like, don't you come near me. When he met with Moses, they had to set bounds around the mountain. And not even the animals were allowed to touch the mountain that God was on. Not even the animals. Don't come near me. I will call you if it's time for you. Which is why it was very scary when when uh, 
called Who Was It? Miriam and I think it was Miriam and Aaron that got called they got called out by God uh, over that because Miriam was was murmuring against Moses. That's like getting that's bigger than getting called to the principal's office. When God said, You better come over here now, it was not a good sign for you because he was very standoffish. He was putting a distance and a barrier between him and sin. That veil was going to be nice and three feet thick to keep you away. So even if you touched the outside of the veil, there was no way that that sinful anything was going to get anywhere near it where it shouldn't. But think about the directional change. And this is why we know God. You know, well, I think a lot of people think that uh, that the veil was like the veil of a bride where you could see through it. And anybody could just go up there and just rip it if they wanted to. That's not the case. You would not see through that. That was three feet thick. Three feet thick. That's insane. The small end of the swimming pool. It was that thick. It was three foot. God himself could be the only one to tear it. There was no way anybody else would tear that. And God struck it from the top to the bottom. And now he says, come up. Hey, bring it in. Bring it in. All of you. I know not just one of you. All of you. Come here. And that's what God does. He wants us to come to him. He's a very personal God now. Now Paul quotes uh, Psalm 8-4 to reassure the transitional Jews that the, the God that saved him was and is a personal God. Imagine how hard that would be for, for Jewish believers at that time that put their faith and their trust in Christ to now say, what do we do? This is a God that told us to stay away. Now Paul has to reassure him that that's not the case anymore. Thanks to Jesus, because no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now through Jesus, we have access to the Father and he welcomes us because when we go through Jesus, we have gone through complete and pure righteousness and we are holy as you can possibly be when you come before God. That's why when he presents us faultless before God, that's why and how he can. Because now uh, we are not only just washed in the blood of the Lamb, we are made his righteousness. Can you imagine being pure righteousness? Think about that. Only God's pure righteousness. Well, that's what you're going to be. You will be pure righteousness one day. You will look and sound and walk and talk like God. Think about that. Everything's changing, folks. Everything's changing. Where we're headed is important to God. That's why Jesus even came in the first place. To save us. To seek us out. To save us. To make us righteousness. That we can be where he is. Think about that. I, I, I just can't hardly put it into words. That Jesus took the sins of the whole world. Abolish them. And now we're all going to be equal righteousness when we get to heaven. That's amazing to me. So that's one of the reasons God is mindful of you. Is because of the price he paid for you. God's investment in you. That he wants to nurture. He wants to make it grow. Does anybody invest in here? I'm not going to ask you where or whatever. Anybody invest in anything? Okay. A few people invest. 
Now, what do you want to have happen with that investment? You want to see it do something, right? You want to see it increase. Not just be that investment. Okay, well, I put X amount in this and it just stays there. That doesn't really do much. That's called a bank. And then it won't even stay there because they take their fees out of it, right? Amen for the institutions. <laughs> no, what do you want to see happen? You want to see that good things are happening with that, that it's growing, it's multiplying, it's becoming bigger than what that investment was. Now, this, this is a mind blower, okay? Prepare yourself for this. Because think of the investment of the blood of Christ. That is an investment in you, but you are going to surpass that because God will bring you to a place where you can. You are going to, that's the down, the Holy Spirit was the earnest. What is that? The down payment. That's not the whole shebang. That's only part of it. Right? God's got something bigger the, in you that he wants you to, to, to have happen with you. He's got something bigger. That, that was more than just redeeming lost man and just a pity story where you're going to die and you're going to burn and you're going to go to hell and I need to rescue you. Hey, this is a lot bigger picture than that. That's the beginning. Salvation is only the beginning of what God expects. That is God's investment in you. And what does he want? He said, I should have had my own with usury. He wants, you should have taken it to the exchangers. Right? He told the guys with the talent, with the guy that just buried his talent, you should have done like the other two. You should have taken what I gave you, and you should have taken it to the exchangers, and you should have made me money on what I gave you so that I would have mine plus some. God has given us the talent. He, the, the salvation is the talent. That is your gift. But he expects you to do more than just hold on to it or bury it. He wants you to develop it. He wants you to, to nurture it, to grow it, so that you become way bigger than the original investment. That is God's plan. And that is how we will reach the world, is by letting those things, and, and you find them different things in the Word of God, and, and, and to help us along our way, and by half of the, the 90, actually 90% of our problem, 90% of our problem is that we're just never really willing to fully submit. Let's just put it where the rubber meets the road. We're not willing to submit our whole life to him. We're not willing to say, okay, yep, you can have my career, you can have my things, you can have my houses, you can have my everything. You just take it, Lord, you do it as you want with it. I'm going to go out, I'm going to win souls, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to church, I'm going to help the church, I'm going to go over here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to help my humanity, I'm going to help the community. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Just, just let me know what you want me to do. Lead me, guide me. Here it all is. Take. Here am I. Take it all. We're not willing to do that. Like Abraham. Hey, guess what? Pack up your family. Pack up your stuff. Leave the rest behind. Go, and I'll tell you where to stop. Ain't nobody here going on that journey. Because we don't know. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? And I've got ties here, and I've got ties there. And i got family over here, and I can't leave them. Well, they might be sick and dying, or they might be this and that. And I can't leave there because of this and that, and I'm going to live with regret. And we excuse ourselves away from what? From fully submitting to God. We're not developing our gift. We're not developing the investment that God placed within us. God wants to do that. I'm way off my outline. But I know God wanted me to say it. He wanted me to say it. Now, God thinks upon us. How do you know that? Psalm 40, 
Verse 5, many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Listen, God thinks about you more than you can number it. How about that, folks? Yeah, I'd say we're in his thoughts, huh? If it's more thoughts than can even be numbered, how much does God think about you? A lot. Psalm 40, verse 17, But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. You know that whole I'm poor and needy thing? When we were in evangelism, we were always hurting. Always. I don't care where we went, we were hurting. And there's this road that we kept passing down in Ohio, and it was called Need More Road. And every time we went down, every time we passed it, I would say, yep, that's where we need to live. <laughs> we need to live on Need More Road, because we always need more. And uh, my grandma, she was really funny. My grandma on my dad's side, and she, uh, his mom, she was really funny. Now, he had a Harvest Time Crusades, of course, in, in the beginning stages, and he had this hat with, like, rhinestones that said HTC uh, on there. And I'm going to tell this just because it's funny. Uh, God, God bless the ministry, and it was all great, but the, it's, the big slogan was, our, our dreams are big, but our, are big, but our funds are small, right? So every time we, we come in there and keep me wearing that hat, Grandma... Would, would say every single time, well, here comes hard time Charlie. <laughs> That's his hard time Charlie hat. What's going on with that? She was a trip, man. She was hilarious. Uh, both, both of my grandparents were, uh, my grandmas especially, were very, very funny. They're just funny people. And, uh, and they always brought joy to you. Now, God watches us. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. God cares for us, Luke 12, 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. God sent his son to die for us. That's a huge one. Romans 5, 6, for when we were... Yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. God cares about what we care about. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God cares about what we endure in Hebrews 5, 2. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. God hears us when we pray. To him, John, uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will show thee, answer thee, show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest, uh, knowest not. Why is God mindful? Mindful, he always thinks about us. Why is he mindful? Because we are his creation. We're his creation. He says, the works of thy hands. Psalm 100 uh, and verse 3 says, I almost said 100.3, that's funny. Uh, 100 verse 3 Know ye that the Lord he is God It is he that hath made us And not we ourselves We are his people and the sheep of his pasture Secondly He's mindful of us because he loved us Enough to die for us Yet he should taste death for every man In Romans 5 8 But God commendeth his love toward us And that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Thirdly, because he desires for us to be with him. Verse 10. In bringing many sons into glory. John 14, 3. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He is thinking about us. It, you know, and we are the church. That's his bride. And he longs, I, I don't know, 
and I, I couldn't hardly stand it. I couldn't hardly stand it till I could get married. Rachel was two and a half hours away from me, living in Gobbles, Michigan. Gobbles. That's how I always make fun of it. I'm like Gobbles. That's why I like to go there for Thanksgiving, so I can go <laughs> run around and be goofy. But yeah, she's up there two and a half hours away from me. And I knew that we were going to be together. She knew we were going to be together. And it was it was just like chomping at the bits to get to an altar somewhere and get married and start our life together. And this last August, we celebrated 19 years together. Amen. Yeah, this, this next year, is, we're hitting the big 20. That's crazy. I mean, that's crazy to think that that's gone by that fast. But it has. But listen, God is no different. Listen, God put everything in us. He put our emotions in us. He, he, he does that. But he longs for us to be with him. You, there, there's no groom that was getting married, by choice at least, that wanted nothing more than to, to be with that and get that started and to get that life started together. You long to be with them. You long after them. Your thoughts are with them. You're always thinking about them, talking about them, wanting to be with them, wondering how they're doing, wondering what's going on, and all of those things because you're not with them. That whole time, that's what you're longing to do. God is no different. Jesus wants to be with us. He wants us to be where he's at. He wants that. You know, some of the bride may not want to get married yet. Some of the bride acts like, so like they might have cold feet. Well, I need this and this and this and that to happen before Jesus comes. No, you don't. You don't need that. You don't need that at all. What we need is for Jesus to come. What we need is to be where sin can no longer hurt us. We need to be where, where we can always never have to say goodbye again. How many times, just this last year, do we stand and have to say, see you later, to a loved one from this church? Or that we know a lot of funerals, big people, pillars, testimonies. Think about that. When we get to heaven, goodbyes are gone. They're gone. There's no more parting. There's no more sorrow. There's no more sadness. You won't even have a bummer day. You won't even have a bummer day. Not one split second of anything negative will ever be again. For you, God longs to be with us. He wants us to be with him. I believe I believe that. I believe that tonight. I believe Jesus can't wait, hardly wait for the Father to say, Go! It's time! The time is fulfilled! Go get your bride! I think that's what he wants more than anything. Because he thinks about us that much. Wow. You know, when you think about God thinking about you that much, doesn't it kind of make you feel bad? Why would it make me feel bad? Because you don't think about Him that much. You don't think about Him. You don't desire Him that way. You don't want Him to just come and sweep us off our feet and take us away. When you think about the love that God is putting into that side of the relationship, we ought to be ashamed of what we're putting in. 
There ought to be more praise. There ought to be more, more love shown. There ought to be more of all of that from all of us. It's not near enough. I don't care what we... We're limited in what we do. So think about that, this, this, that we're limited, but even we limit because of our limitations. We limit and scale it back down. I'm too busy to show adoration to the Lord. I'm too busy. Oh, well then we better start making some different priorities. We need to start making some different choices because, listen, we need to, now we're, we need to start thinking about long term. Okay? Because we're in, we're in the shortest short term that you can be in right now. Till Jesus comes. I, I believe it with everything going on. Everything, I mean the Bible is playing out right before our eyes. We're seeing all kinds of these things go on. We know it's coming. I think it's time that we take a look at our lives and that we rearrange some things. And we start preparing for that long term ride. Of our eternal home. That's, that's important and it has to be important to us. It should matter more than it does. <clears throat> and lastly, he thinks about us because we are his family. We are his family. We see that in verse 11. He is not ashamed to call them brethren. Wow. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, the Bible says, For ye are... All the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And of course, we have 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. that says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. Because it knew him not. Why is the world so evil to us? Well, because they don't know you. Because you are an alien. You know what? It's funny. But we are aliens. We're aliens because we're not from this place. We're heavenly bodies. We are heavenly bound. We, we, don't, we don't belong here. It's not where we belong. We were never intended to, to, to stay here forever. Eventually, this is our mission field. You were born into a mission field. Where somewhere along the line, somebody reached you with the gospel. You accepted it because it was at the time when you could accept it. You were drawn of God uh, to accept it. And now you're going forth and you're trying to learn how to be a Christian. And we're trying to learn how to get to be more like God while trying to do some little tiny bit of work. Uh, that we, the, the, a lot of times we, we think is more work than it is. If we really added up our works, they wouldn't add up as much as what we think they were. God's got the record of it all. One day you'll see it and you'll be like, oh yeah, I guess I could have done more. I guess I could have shifted some things around. I guess I could have dropped that other thing off and Use that to do something for God. But you know, by that time, by the time you get to see it, it'll be too late to change it. We can do more. Burnout is a myth. It's a myth. Sorry, but with, with just a few services in a week, come on, you're not, you're not doing that much. You're not doing that much that you're going to burn out. Think about the kind of days the disciples had. Just at the feeding of the 5,000 plus women and children. 
Some could have been upwards of 20,000 or more. Really, at the end of it. They had sat down in groups of fifties and they were serving them. Imagine that. Now, they were busy serving all day long. Then they had 12 baskets left over and you think, well, that was a great way to end your day, but that's not where their day ended. They still had to get to a ship and sail across the sea right after that. And they originally were going to take their break. They were going for their scheduled break. But yet the crowd pressed on Jesus. And he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. They're weary. We can't just send them home. Well, if we had 200 penny worth of bread, we couldn't feed them all. Jesus, Jesus takes a little lunch. He takes a lunchable. He takes a lunchable and fills 20,000 plate people and a basket for each of the doubters that were at his side. Then after that, Jesus went to, to the mountain to pray and sent them over to the sea. That was all on the same day, folks. Think about that. Talk about burnout. No, I don't believe so. We, we don't do enough to even think we could have burnout. I don't care what you're doing, you're not doing that much. We've progressively gotten less and less work than they were doing. And think about this. If after three years, Paul could say, I'm pure from the blood of all men because I've ceased not day and night with tears to warn everybody. I called God for a record on my soul. Think about that. He called God for a record on his soul after three years of labor and was pure from the blood of all men at that time. Three years. That's the length of Jesus' ministry. Three, three and a half years. Think about that. And we've been saved for how long? I know it's different amounts for everybody. Well, let's think about this. It's more than three years. What are we, what are we doing? Who are we warning? How are we, what, what kind of efforts really are going on? Now it does help that we've got missionaries that we support and they're out there doing it. They're out there getting the job done. But they're not doing night and day. No, nobody's going to do night and day. We, we're not built like that anymore. Because that was their, that's what you call being full time. That was all he had was ministry. That was it. And the compassion and the drive and the urgency that people are dying and going to hell mattered. Paul wasn't working to try to, 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 try to build anything but the church. As a matter of fact, he made tents of, 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 while he's doing all the ministry. To try to make and sell tents to finance the mission project. Plus warning people day and night. Plus being in prison. Plus being beaten. Plus being all these other things and the care of all seven churches at the same time. Tell me again how you were burned out. I don't think so, Scooter. You're not burned out. You're not even close to burnout. Some people act like if they they teach a, a, a they, they teach a class once a week that they're, they're oh I just can't do it I've done this forever and you taught one class forever well praise the Lord for that but you're in no re, you're in no uh, danger of burnout when people and men of God and, and, and women of God and you, you can see them all through the Bible ministering day and night and wherever they were at at all times we don't do that in our day and that's where we're off that's where we're bad compared to the early church because it, it meant something back then to the point that every man sold all their possessions they gave it to the church and that when every man's needs were met as they had them. Everybody sold everything. So you, you, now think 
about this. Let's say the Apostle Paul walks in through the back door. He comes up here and he says, listen, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to be identified with Christ, I need you to go and I need you to sell everything you have and bring it back here. And then the church will distribute your needs as you have them. Who's doing it? Oh, we don't have a bunch of spiritual people that are lifting your hand. That you're going to go home right now and sell everything you have. But that's what they did in the early church. Think about that. Let that, let that kind of dedication, let that kind of sold out to Jesus sink into your soul tonight. Think about that. Now, I'm not saying you need to go home and sell everything. I'm just giving you an I, I'm giving you a picture of what it was and where it's at. We are not at the same operating level that they were in the early church days. Faith has diminished that through, through, the, through the annals of time to the point that, you know, even Jesus said, well, 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 will he find faith? Will he even find it when he comes back? That's how far off the church has gone. From where it started. And I think we can do more. I know we can do more. We should be more mindful of him. Because we. He is mindful of us. Just let that soak in your heart. Take it. Because I'm preaching to myself too. We every single one of us can and should do more. Where is that spirit of the early church? What would happen if we got a hold of some of that? We wouldn't have any problems at all. We wouldn't have financial problems. We wouldn't have people problems. We wouldn't have attendance problems. Because they met every single day in the temple with one accord. Every day. And don't sit here and act like we could meet every day for church because you know what? We can't get them, we can't get them back for all three services in one day. Or a Wednesday service. They met every single day in the temple. They broke bread together. They went house to house together. They ministered together. What is man that thou art mindful of him? We are a lot of those things. But God help us to get a little Holy Ghost fire that they had in the early church. So that we become more worth it. Because you know what? God is getting the short end of the deal. What's his investment look like in you? That's what we all need to say. God's invested this in me. What is he getting as his return? Think about that as we pray. We do our invitation. Heavenly Father, bless now the invitation. I pray you speak uh, to us, Lord. Listen to us. Those that will bring themselves before you. Pray you just minister to our hearts, Lord. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the challenge to our hearts tonight. There's not a person in this room, including and especially me, that doesn't need what was just preached. Help us to Get a little bit more of a taste of what we can do to be more like the early church. The power, the fervency that they had, the dedication, the faithfulness that they had, the givingness that they had, the compassion for souls and the urgency of that in this late hour and time. As we expect your approach and your return, to come get us to be very soon. Help us to do more, not less. 
Now, move in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, 